Hello everyone, Mr. Waz here, and welcome to the 20th episode of Wazly Science. In this episode, we are going to be discussing polymers. So we're going to discuss how they're made, where they come from, the process of polymerization, the difference between biopolymers and synthetic polymers, as well as the main three polymers, um, linear, branched, and cross-linked. So that being said, let's get started. Now, some basic vocabulary that you need to understand before we begin um, polymers is that mono means one, you should know that, and poly means many, and mer, M-E-R, means unit. So, what would polymer mean, and what would monomer mean? You should be able to figure that out, put it together, make sure you write that down so you know the meaning of the definition of polymer and monomer. Now some of you that already kind of know what polymers are, you're probably thinking, why the heck is this in earth science and environmental science? This is really, polymers are really organic chemistry. Here's why. Because we've been discussing a lot about plastics in quarter three. Plastics come from oil. Okay, and oil is a fossil fuel and we are running out of oil. Oil is a non-renewable resource, and we use plastic on everything. We also discussed about how plastic is harmful to the environment. Well, plastics are made of polymers. So with this unit, we are discussing exactly how plastic is made. So plastic comes from oil. And here's a nice diagram because it shows us where our oil that we drill comes from. 47 of it goes to gasoline. 7% goes to boiler oil, which is just oil to um, heat different uh, buildings and such. And then others, 20%, uh, which is a large chunk, goes to diesel, which is used for trucks mainly. And then heating homes. 10% goes to jet fuel. 10% uh, goes to others. 3% goes to asphalt and roads. And then there's just, if you total all that, that's 97%. And then you got 3% left. And of that 3%, half of that 3%, which is 1.5 of the total, goes towards like all the plastics in the world, which this totally surprised me. I thought a lot more of the oil in the world actually went to plastic, but only a small, tiny amount goes to that. This shows the process of plastic, and we're going to discuss it more. But um, you go from oil to a refinery which separates the oil separates it from gasoline and such um, and then you have some monomers and at a polymer plant they take the polymer they take polymers they take monomers and connect them and form polymers which we're going to talk about that that's polymerization and then they chop them up into little pellets which you see on the right over here and then after they chop them up into pellets they ship them out and, and separate them out by whatever colors they want and then they end up to the supply chain and distributors and then they end up at factories which take the pellets and mold them into whatever shapes and different sizes that they want and they could end up making the front part of a car so that's that's how plastic is made and if you would like to get a great understanding of polymers. I recommend that before we move any further that you watch this video. It's the Crash Course Chemistry. He explains polymers very well and the history of polymers and then how they are formed. You really should pay close attention to the like the first um, five minutes of the video. The, the parts at the end may be a little confusing because we haven't gone over those parts yet. Polymers are like patterns. Now before I show you all the organic formulas, let's just think of it in a simple sense here. So monomers are the repeating unit itself. So an example of a monomer could be just one, two, three. And then the polymer would be the result of the repeating units. So in this case, it would be one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, all connected together. So if we look at the very bottom here, this is an example of a polymer on the bottom, all these shapes that you see. Now look at it and try to identify the monomer. And again, the monomer would just be the repeating unit. So if you look at it, you can see square, circle, triangle, pentagon. Square, circle, triangle, pentagon. 
So the monomer would actually be square, circle, triangle, pentagon. So again, if you look at this and I ask you how many monomers are on this polymer, you should say three. All right, very good. All right, let's classify two different polymers here. The first one are biopolymers. So these are found in living things like you and me. We have DNA, we have carbohydrates. All right, there are actually natural polymers inside of us. Uh, silk from spiders is also a polymer. Wool from sheep, those are polymers. Cellulose, which are found inside of plants, sugars, proteins, pasta, these are all pol these are all biopolymers. And the big thing about these is that they are biodegradable. So they're actually things that can break down, and, and a lot of these things you can actually put into a compost pile, which we discussed in Unit 9, because these things will decompose naturally through a process known as decomposition, biodegradation. We talked about this. And then there are synthetic polymers. These are things that are made in a factory from crude oil. And they include things like plastic bottles, shoes, tires, polyester, which is clothing, Teflon, nylon, Kevlar, all things made of plastic they do not break down. They are partially recyclable though, which is very important and it's why that we need to make sure that all these things that we throw away that are made of plastic, any of them that are recyclable, do make their way to the recycle bin because they last forever. Here is some pictures of biopolymers. So you have wood, you have DNA, you have pasta, you have shells on the bottom. Middle picture is actually um, something that you know is still in the works you don't really see it around but those are plates that are disposable and they are made of biopolymers which means that they will break down naturally through the process known as biodegradation if you look over here these are synthetic polymers so you have things like the Teflon from a frying pan PVC you have nylon on the top left you have carpeting okay you have your plastic bags you have your styrofoam. So all these things here that you see on this page are made from crude oil. This is made from oil. This is stuff that we have to get from oil. All right, now that we have a basic understanding of what polymers are, it's time to move on to the organic chemistry side of it. So before we get into that, I need to introduce to you some common chemistry language. You will see this throughout the video now. You will also see these things as a 10th grader. You learn polymers again as a 10th grader. So if you are struggling in 10th grade, please feel free to refer back to this video. It could help you out a lot. Also, you will see things like this on the CAP test. So I don't want them to be intimidating to you. I want you to know what they are and be able to handle it because you're smart and you can do this. All right. So first, let's start with the double bond. So a double bond is something that you would often see in an example like this. This is ethylene, and in the middle you see an equal sign. That is the double bond, and what that represents is that there are not just one, but two different pairs of electron being shared. You can see it over here on the right with two oxygens. They have created a double bond, so there's actually a total of four electrons involved in a double bond, two different pairs. The next is the carbon chain abbreviation. Now what that is, is this is kind of, this is a polymer right here that you see on the right. And these are ethylenes bonded together for, through the process of polymerization, forming polyethylene. And to make life easier, instead of drawing all those pesky hydrogens and carbons connected together, they will just make this zigzag line that looks like the middle of Charlie Brown's t-shirt. So that is the carbon chain abbreviation. So if you ever see a zigzag line like that, just know that's probably a bunch of ethylenes connected together, forming polyethylene. And in the bottom one, we have the carbon ring. A carbon ring, would, it'll sometimes look like this, and other times it will look like this. And all a carbon ring is, is a bunch of carbons in the inside connected by hydrogens at each tip. Of, and they're usually a hexagon shape, which means that there are six hydrogens involved and six carbons involved. And then you can also see that there are double bonds in every other carbon. And that's what these lines that you see 
represent those double bonds. So this is a single bond here, this is a double bond here. And the reason why that they make this abbreviation is this would take an awfully long time to make in comparison to what you see on the right. And in some monomer chains, you would be having several of these squares. So it's just an easy way for a chemist to describe a certain monomer. All right, so let's talk about what are organic compounds because organic compounds is what we can use to make polymers. A organic compound is a covalently bonded compound that consists of the element carbon and it excludes carbonates and oxides. It is almost always containing some sort of hydrogens connected to the carbons in the middle and their classification depends on the functional group and they usually have some sort of carbon hydrogen bond and carbon carbon bond so let's take a look at some examples we have methane here CH4 is this an organic compound so the black part in the middle here would represent the carbon in the four white spheres would represent those four hydrogens yes that is an organic compound let's look at another one well we have butane C4H10 so you have four carbons here which are the blue spheres and then the gray spheres are the 10 hydrogens is this organic compound yes it is because it contains carbon and hydrogen acetone you have ch3 co h3 is this an organic compound the black spheres represent the carbon you can see the carbon guys is always in the middle and then the hydrogens hang off the outside and then we have a double bond forming over here from the one oxygen. Yes, this is an organic compound. It's got the carbons and hydrogens. You can have an oxygen too, and it still be an organic compound. And then we have one more here, carbonate, CO3. We've seen this before when we've seen uh, carbonic acid. Um, we have no hydrogens here, just all oxygens. This is not an organic compound. This is an inorganic compound. So we're not making any polymers with this. It's not very useful to us in the polymerization. So now let's talk about hydrocarbons because the type of inorganic compounds that we are gonna be focusing on that help us make polymers are known as hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons are things that what crude oil is made of, natural gas, as well as coal, okay, hydrocarbons. And they are just in they are just organic compounds that involve carbon and hydrogen. And what always, always, always happens is that you'll see the carbon in the middle and the hydrogens will surround the carbon because the hydrogens form single bonds and the carbon can form up to four single covalent bonds. Uh, carbon, it can even f share two of its electrons and form double bonds, which you saw before. It can even share three of its electrons and form triple bonds. The simplest of hydrocarbons is methane, and methane is simply natural gas. So that stuff that comes out of the landfills from the methane recovery pipes, that's CH4. So maybe you're all seeing how this comes together now. Now what you learned in eighth grade is that elements like to bond. They like to form ionic bonds, which is when you have a metal and non-metal bond. And then they also like to form covalent bonds, is which you have non-metals bonding together. We are focusing right now on non-metals covalent bonds here. So there are four elements that you really need to know well and they are hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon. Now hydrogen, as you may remember, only has one electron. So it can only form one bond. It can't form more than one bond. In other words, hydrogen has to be the endpoints of all these polymers and monomers you see, because it, can, it can't be the middle, it has to be the end. Oxygen can form two different bonds because it will have two electrons available to share with. Nitrogen can form three bonds. It can form up to one triple bond. That's a possible thing. And then carbon is our most valuable asset when it comes to polymers because it can form four bonds, four different bonds. So it can bond with four different atoms because carbon has four valence electrons, meaning that it has four electrons 
that hang on its outer shell. So if we look over here, we can see carbon. Carbon has a total of six electrons, but the first two electrons hang out in that first shell. The four electrons hang out in this second shell, and all these electrons could very easily bond to, let's say, four hydrogens, or to four hydrogens and become methane, or two oxygens and become carbon dioxide. And an easy way to remember this is the abbreviation HONC, H-O-N-C, HONC, beep beep, because hydrogen is the first one, forms one bond, and then oxygen's two, nitrogen's three, carbon's four. And this will be very useful for us when you guys start to see different monomers, because you can see how the different of these four elements form different bonds. And what we can see right here is that we have hydrogen, 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 hydrogen. And the red represents hydrogen's electrons, and the green represents the carbon in the middle's electrons. So you can see here that this is a bond, this is a bond, a bond, a bond. The hydrogen on this side is happy because it wants two electrons to feel full. So is this one, and this one, and this one. And then you can see that the carbon is also happy because if you count off all the electrons, remember you can have eight electrons in that second shell in order to feel stable. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So the carbon is happy as well because the idea of bonding is to make your outer shell feel full, which is stable. And for most cases, except hydrogen, that would involve eight electrons. For hydrogen, they only need two because it only takes two electrons to fill up that first shell. And if this is all very confusing for you, um, I guess that you didn't really get it when you did it in eighth grade, and that's all right. Please see me for extra help. All right, so if you're at this point in the video, I recommend taking a break and finishing the rest of this another day, because um, now we're gonna begin the process of polymerization. So we're gonna talk about how monomers, single units, become polymers, which is many units. Here are the steps with polymerization. The first step is that you have to break the double bond that is in the monomer. So in this example here, we have ethylene, which has a double bond in the middle. So there are four electrons right here, two pairs that are sharing. Now, the way that they break that bond is they usually introduce some sort of chemical into a batch of ethylene, and the chemical causes the bonds to break. At that point, the electrons will then move to the outside, and you can see that on this part here, this represents an electron ready to grab onto to another ethylene, and over here we have another electron ready to grab onto another ethylene. So this is still a single monomer. And this will all happen at the same time to all of the ethylenes that are in the batch that the chemical inter you know, was introduced to this batch of ethylene. And then what happens is the monomers then link together by their single electrons and just form single bonds. So you can see that going on here. There are three different ethylenes and it just became polyethylene. And they'll make these long, long chains in which they can then turn that into plastic. So that's, that's how it's done in a sort of simple sense. And what's really cool is that when they introduce whatever that chemical is, it's some sort of chemical agent that they use to break the double bond. Through the process, the reaction will cause the chemical to don't really be the to no longer be the chemical anymore. It usually just becomes H2O, water. So water ends up being the byproduct. So a lot of the times, like the polyethylene will just be like with water. All right, so now it's time for you to draw polypropylene. I have provided you with propylene, which is the monomer, and what you need to do is follow the three steps that I just said and turn this propylene into polypropylene. I want to see at least three propylenes properly attached to one another. That is part of your homework. Be ready for me to check it. Be ready for me to be disappointed if it's not there. That's all I'm going to say. And if you don't remember how to do it, go back in this video about three minutes and watch those steps that I did again. And that should help you out.
Now what I'd like you to do is put this all in your notes and I'd like you to circle the monomer in this. I hope you did it. So here is what the monomer would look like. There were four monomers there and what I did in the bottom over here is I got rid of the two electrons on the outside and created and went backwards and put the double bond in there. So here is what the monomer would look like. All right, now we're going to get into the three main types of polymers. These three main types are used for different purposes. They have different pros and cons. So let's begin with linear polymers. So linear polymers are the weakest in terms of strength, but they provide the greatest flexibility. Um, they are used in our DNA is made up of linear polymers. Um, polystyrene is made a styrofoam is made up of linear polymers as well as carpets are made up of linear polymers. Um, these are two diagrams that are used on the cap. That's why I have them. But what's funny is they are terribly inaccurate. Like the one on the left, it just has carbons with like single bonds. But this isn't a real polymer. There would obviously be hydrogens attached on each side. And then this one, I guess each black circle represents a monomer and since they're all connected together these are two polymers so I, I I realize that these diagrams aren't that great but I'm just trying to familiarize them because um, unfortunately the cap test just loves to use these so I, I'd like you to see expose you to these types of, of diagrams so linear pol polymers um, like I said they're used in carpets in microwave food containers um, if you just like connected a bunch of paper clips together, you'd have an example of a linear polymer. Um, they can range from a thousand to ten thousand and even more monomer units. And remember, when it comes to polymers, each monomer is the exact same. It's not like the monomer has to be repeated. So you can't just have different monomers attached on a polymer. That's really important. So when you have a polymer, every single unit that is repeated is an exact same clone. It's, they're like all the same thing. You can't just have this like wild card monomer that's mixed in. It just doesn't work that way. Now on to the branched polymers. So with the branched polymers, they provide greater strength than the linear, but they have less flexibility. And examples of these are milk jugs, bottles, and shopping bags. So these are the types of diagrams that you may see on the cap test. So basically, they are just linear polymers, but with branches attached to them. And it's important to know that these branches that you see are the exact same monomer. So the monomer that is located here is the exact same as the monomer here. It's just that their um, format is in sort of branches instead of just straight lines. And so here you can see you know, another poor diagram that just shows carbons, but each of the carbons really represent a monomer. They're just using the letter C, I guess, to represent carbon, but really it could be a whole molecular, uh, a chemical, for a whole monomer full of different elements and compounds. Now branch polymers are the most common polymer that is used because they have such a large range of strength and flexibility. And our main two types of branch polymers are the LDPE and the HDPE. LDPE is low density polyethylene and HDPE is high density polyethylene. So what you can see is that with LDPE, you, have, you can have things like plastic wrap, gloves, shopping bags, which are very flexible but can be easily punctured or teared apart. And then with HDPE, when you have things like shampoo bottles, milk jugs, buckets, even hefty garbage bags, you have much more strength but less flexibility. And the reason for this is it's all in the branches. So you can see the branches on the left side here that they are longer. And what they're doing is they are causing the linear parts of the polymer to be more spaced out. And because there is less mass over a greater amount of space, you have a lower density, so you have more flexibility. So the diagram that you see on the left 
would represent LDPE, low density. And if you look at the diagram on the right, you see that the branches are much shor shorter and there are fewer of them. That would represent HDPE. So in the one on the right, you would have, it would be higher density because they are crammed more together. So there would be less flexibility and more strength. So here's just some examples, some pictures of low density polyethylene. And here's some examples of high density polyethylene. So you can see the buckets, the milk jugs, the hefty bags, just like I said. Okay, so for our last polymer, we have the cross-linked polymer. And as you've guessed it, this one is the strongest and least flexible. So what's interesting about this one is you have the linear polymers, and now they are connected by sort of ladder spoke pieces here. And that provides the greatest amount of strength. And examples of cross-linked polymers would be things like bowling balls, and tires and here's just another way of looking at it like with this these paper clips that you see okay so now what is interesting about this is this is how tires are made this shows vulcanization which is a term that is used to start the process of cross links so we have what we have here that I am circling is your a regular monomer and right below is the exact same monomer. So through a process of adding sulfur and heat, the two monomers become linked together. So bonds, the, what happens is this double bond gets broken that was in the monomer itself and gets connected by sulfur. This is a permanent thing. You can't go back when you make a tire. You can't make a tire into something else. All you can do with the rubber from tires is melt it down with a lot of heat and a lot of and a lot of pollutants get released too in the process and possibly shape it into something else. But a tire is a tire. And what's interesting about this is tires are rubber and natural rubber from rubber trees is very brittle in the cold and it gets sticky in the heat. So rubber is not really ideal. But when you vulcanize it with sulfur, which is why when you burn rubber you smell sulfur, that's the cross-linked um, that's the cross-linked piece of tires that you are smelling being burned onto the asphalt. So anyway, when you apply heat and sulfur to natural rubber, it becomes vulcanized and it makes it stronger, even more elastic. It basically just makes it totally awesome, better than it ever could be. The only problem with this is that you can't go back. So cross-linked um, cross polymers cannot be recycled. They cannot be heated down and turned into other things. Once a tire, always a tire. So some words to review it here. Elastomers. I haven't really talked about elastomers yet, but they are a cross-linked structure. Examples of elastomers are actually silly putty. So silly putty is not very rigid, it's not very strong as normal plastic, but it can be stretched when the force is applied. When the stress is removed, it, it will form back into some sort of shape. And, but like I said, with cross-linked um, structures, you can't really recycle them. So silly putty is only silly putty. It doesn't really become something else. Um, vulcanization was a process we just talked about, and that is when you are cross-linking by introducing sulfur, and this is what is done to tires mainly. And then plastics, that's what the branched and linear polymers are, mainly those branched polymers. So things can be molded into shapes under heat and pressure, but they don't really go back when force is applied to them. When force, when you smash a plastic bottle, it doesn't just whoop, come back into a plastic bottle, it, it remains smashed. And um, plastic bags, and many, many other things are examples of these. All right, so I have two concepts for you. The first one is a thermoplastic. And thermoplastics are what the linear branch polymers that we've been talking about are made of. They can be melted when heated. They can be bent. They're very flexible. They're very cheap. They get worn out by the sun. And examples of these would be polypropylene, which is PET, acrylic, nylon, polycarbonate, polyester, polyethylene, PVC, polystyrene. These are all thermoplastics. They are the main things that we use and that we can recycle. That's a big thing with thermoplastics is they can be recycled. Then you have the thermosets. 
Those are the cross-linked polymers. They cannot be remelted and remolded when they are formed. These are the polymers that are permanently held together. They are, the, they are much stronger than the thermoplastics, though. So you guys can kind of see those pros and cons that way in here. They, um, they go through vulcanization process. Now, examples of these can be epoxy, uh, polyester, uh, formaldehydes, and polyurethane. So here's that recycle code that I keep talking about. You have the one, two, three, four, five, six. There's also seven, which is other, and that actually is being used more today. One is the fast track plastics, the, the PET, and then two is the high density polyethylene, which is those branch polymers like milk jugs. Three is PVC, in this one it just says vinyl, but PVC, so all those PVC pipes, that's three. And then for four, you have the low density polyethylene, the LDPE, so plastic bags. And then five is a polypropylene, which is often recycled, microwavable containers. And then you have polystyrene for number six. Polystyrene is one that you generally don't want to recycle because it's very difficult to recycle because it has contaminants with it. All right, guys, we did it. We learned about polymers. So I got five really good videos for you. The one in the top middle here you should definitely watch. This is an excellent review on polymers. The ones on the top left and top right are can be used for your Recycle Code project. I highly, highly recommend you use them. They're excellent resources. And on the bottom right, we have something cool going on when you take cornstarch and water to a speaker. So it shows you how polymers can work in that way. And on the bottom left, we have new uh, plastic forming from corn. So this is a biopolymer that can be used for fast track food and such, and then can biodegrade. So that's big things going on in science. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe and take care.